så, så, så kan, kan, kan du ikke tro, at jeg har haft lidt større bla 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 hus, end jeg havde i min tid? Ja, 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 Okay, let's uh, get started. So welcome to this first uh, parallel session. And it's actually on parallel and distributed learning. We have one long talk of 20 minutes and then we have four short talks of 10 minutes each. And I'm very pleased to announce our first speaker, which is Gang Gang Xu. And he's going to give the first talk. Hello everyone for coming. Uh, thank you so much for coming to the session. Uh, my name is Gang Gang Shi. I'm from State University of New York at uh, Binghamton. Um, it's in upstate New York. Um, so today my talk is about the, the optimal tuning for uh, divide and conquer kernel reach regression with massive data. So here is an outline of my talk. First, I'm going to give you a, a motivating example of what's the problem about and then I'm gonna give you a brief introduction of what is kernel reach regression and then we're gonna propose a tuning method called D distributed GCV for divide and conquer kernel reach regression and then finally I'll show you some uh, empirical studies. So one toy example we used in the paper is called the million sum data set which is a publicly available data set. We, it has one million sum tracks know, released during this time period of time from 1922 to 2011. Um, so the response variable we used in this uh, particular project is the year where the song was released. So it's, it's, is it in the 1970s or 1980s, 1990s? And based on some um, tem 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 temporal information of the song, which is 90 dimensional vectors. So one, exa one example, uh, one model can be used to do this job is to model the response variable as the, the year when the sound is released as uh, a nonlinear function of the temporal information, which is 90 dimensional vectors. So F is some nonlinear multivariate functions needs to be estimated. And then the purpose here is to use the temporal information to predict the year of the production for the, the soundtrack, right? 
Um, the popular way, one of the most popular way to estimate F, there are many ways to do so, right? Like neural networks and um, other methods. Here we're gonna use a kernel reach regression. So what is kernel reach regression? It is a long lasting method with, where we, we estimate the functional sp uh, surface uh, using this, uh, by searching the optimal function within this so-called reproducing her kernel Hilbert space um, uh, for the optimal functions that can be used to predict the year of the production. And then uh, this uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space is completely determined by this so-called reproducing kernel function K. And then usually this kernel function is a positive definite function of positive semi-definite function, which has a spectral uh, decomposition in this form. So this mu i is Eigen functions uh, of infinite di dimensions. The phi i's are the Eigen, um, Eigen functions for this kernel. So the, the properties of the kernel functions determine the Hilbert kernel space, and, but the, the kernel is completely de determined by the Eigen functions and Eigen values. Um, and this lambda is a tuning parameter that we will choose to select uh, in a certain way. This tuning parameter pretty much controls the, the trade-off between the roughness of the function and the, the goodness of fit of the data because our data is not a pure signal because there are some noises in it. Like in this model, there are noise turns in this um, response variables. So we need to penalize the roughness of the function. If you choose too small of a lambda, which means you overfit the data, then the, then the generalization of the prediction is not going to be good. So a good choice of lambda is critical for the estimation of this function. Um, there are many types of kernels are available in the literature. Uh, they can be pretty much categorized into several categories based on their Aiken behaviors. For, for example, we could have finite rank kernels, one example would be the polynomial kernels, and which is actually the inner products of these two vectors, and then raised to the power of r. So in this kernel function, there are only finite number of non-zero eigenfunctions. So that means that from the largest to the smallest eigenfunction, there are only r non-zeros. Uh, all the rest of the eigenfunctions in this decomposition are all zeros. And they are also exponentially decaying uh, kernels, which is, in this case, it's called a Gaussian kernel. Um, maybe it has another name, another name, like the radio basis functions. So this Gaussian kernel have the exponentially decaying kernels to zeros, but none of the eigenfunctions, eigenvalues are exactly zero, so it's just decaying really fast. And there are also polynomially decaying functions, like this, um, this function, which is actually essentially a triangle. So this kernel function is, um, has polynomially decaying uh, eigen f eigenvalues, and then the, the, the norm of the reproducing Herbert's kernel space is this function, which is the uh, squared uh, s derivative of this function, which is one measure of how smooth this function is. And then, so, well, the convergence of this estimated function is well, determined by the how fast the eigen eigenvalues decay. So, for example, if you have uh, smoothing splines, which is one member in this category, polynomial decaying functions, and then the optimal uh, convergence rate for the estimated function to the truth is of this order. So, which is determined by the penalty function, and also, you know, the smoothness of the the, the kernel, and then. Well, it has been long now that the optimal choice of this tuning parameter should of this order, but this is mathematically true, but when you uh, like take it to a real problem is, you, the, question, the natural question to ask is, what exactly lambda should I use? So if you think about this rate, well, it, it, it's only an order, that means two times of this number, three times this number, they are of the same order. You have multiple choice of the uh, lambdas, which of the same order, which one do you use? So it's like uh, this um, this rate provides you a general direction. So how large this lambda should be? Then we need a, a data-driven way to pick the actual number within that range, right? So that's our goal. So the solution to the reproducing kernel ridge regression is pretty simple. So eventually, by the representative theorem. 
uh, well, that was long studies is in 1990s, and then the, the estimated function can be represented as the linear combination of the kernels evaluated at all the data points, right? And then previous optimization problem can be rewritten in a, as a an problem of penalized least squares, right? This kern, this K is a grand matrix, which is N by N matrix evaluated all the pairs of the data points, and then this Y is the stack the value of the response variables. All right, so the minimization of this problem is very straightforward. The solution has a closed form, which is, well, basically a retrogression solution, right? And then, well, the last problem here is once the lambda is given, we have a unique solution, and then we have a function to predict the, the year of the prediction, right? So the, the key problem becomes how do we choose lambda? And then there has been a lot of study on this uh, investigation, so what, what might be good choice of lambda. So one popular way, one perhaps the most popular way to choose lambda is the, the so-called generalized cross-validation. So this is the definition of generalized cross-validation. This is the training error. So, and then in the numerator, in the, in the denominator is one minus of a trace of the hat matrix. The hat matrix is defined in this way. So hat matrix times the the observed data is the you know, estimated surface. So this trace is essentially can be interpreted as the effective number of parameters you used in this kernel regression. So think about if you have infinite large number of lambda, then this number is probably going to be zero sometimes because essentially you have a constant function. And if lambda is really, really small, and then the trace of hat matrix is more than the total number of sample size, so this is a very small number. So this GCV will be inflated. So the, a good choice of lambda actually strikes a balance between the, the goodness of fit, which is ref reflected by the training error, but also, no, there is a compromise. You, you don't want to use a too complicated model, or you don't want to do, use a too simple model. So there is a delicate balance in here. So the lambda that actually minimizes GCV function can be shown have a, a very good properties. But the problem here is when the sample size is very, very large, and then the computation of the GCV method requires doing the inverse of this matrix, which is n by n matrix. The computation is huge. So um, the, the computational burden for calculating the hat matrix is uh, n to the power of a cubic, which is mostly too, too much if you have like million sums, right? And then we must find a better way to estimate it. So um, there has been uh, a lot of study on this so-called divide and conquer kernel ridge regressions in recent years. So the idea is pretty simple. You divide the, the big data set into smaller pieces, right? And then you do kernel ridge regression as we pre were previously mentioned on each small data set. And then in the end, you pull all these you know, estimated function on sub data set to take a simple average. And this is going to be the final estimator for the function. All right, so very straightforward idea. And there has been a lot of theoretical studies on this uh, so-called divide and conquer kernel ridge regression. So it has been shown that with an appropriate choice of lambda, this pulled so average estimator also achieved the optimal rate as if you use all the data at once. Right? There's no loss of efficiency in here under certain conditions, of course. But again, so how do we choose lambda in this setting? So this is an open problem and uh, actually a quite challenging one. So it, it, at first it seems to you know, very trivial, this question. So why don't we just like apply GCV to each sub data set? and I choose an optimal lambda for each sub data set, and then pull them together by taking the sub average. So in this case, you would have an optimal lambda j for each sub data set, and then you put them together. But this method doesn't work because, for several reasons. So one of the reasons is because GCV are trying to you know, strike the balance between unbiased and variance trade-off in each individual functions. So in other words, the, the optimal lambda you chosen for each sub data set strike the perfect balance between the bias and variance. So bias and variance are roughly of the same order, right? And then, but the later stage you will take an average 
of these individual functions. But taking the average, the operation of average does not reduce bias. But I would reduce the variance significantly, right? We know the variance of the mean is 1 over n times the variance of the individual functions. So this average in operation actually creates a lot of problems. That means in the previous individual function, you, you are allowed to have bigger variances because you have another way to reduce the variances. So in other words, you, in, in those individual functions, you don't want a perfect balance of bias and variance. You want a larger variance, much smaller bias. So this way, then in this case, GCV doesn't work because GCV is designed to strike the balance between the bias and variance. So, so in other words, if you have an optimal F for each individual data set and then you put them together, the F eventually you get is not globally optimal, it's globally suboptimal. So that means locally optimal function does not lead to globally optimal function estimator, right? So, an ideal way to choose lambda in this case scenario is, well, first of all, I want to make sure that all the individual functions have the same uh, tuning parameters because all of the theoretical studies are based on this uh, assumption that all the sub-functions sub estimator using the same lambda. So the theoretical analysis are based on this assumption. And also, for each individual small data set, we want to intentionally overfit the data, right? And then which, which leads to a small bias, but w much bigger variances, but that's fine. Okay. And then, uh, so we propose this new distributed generalized cross validation methods, which is the training error part is doesn't, uh, doesn't change, but the only change we have here is so um, we would have to, we would let, in the denominator, we add all the degrees of freedom from each individual function. So this summation is like the total number of parameters in all the functions. But in addition to just compare this to the total number of parameters, we divide an actual so number of data sets you have. So this is small modification to this generalized cross validation score, but it, it turned out to be very effective. And when you only have one big data set, you don't divide the data set into small chunks. And then it is reduced to generalized cross validation. So the computation is much smaller in this case, which is basically depends on how large the M is, and it could be you know, as small as N to the power of square. So there's one magnitude of uh, reduction in terms of the computation, also the memories. So there are very nice properties for, for this distributed learning function, uh, generalized cross validation function. So this theorem basically says minimizing lambda with respect to the distributed generalized function is equivalent to minimizing the true loss function. So this L, L, L function is a true loss function for the estimated functions. So this is the best you can do. Um, so let's do see some empirical studies. In these empirical studies, we have generated data. Well, somehow, let me quickly show you some results. And um, this is the computation times of the distributed GCV. So M is the number of folds we divide the data into. So when, when I increase the number of you know, divisions for the entire data set, you can see the, the computation time reduced significantly. And then this is a comparison of the actual losses. So this is the actual loss by using the lambda picked by the GCV. And this is the best possible loss you can have. You can see they are very close to each other. Right. And then this is the comparisons between the naive GCV method and the distributed GCV method, and you can see every case scenario, no matter how many folds you divide the data into, and the, the distributed GCV is always much better. And this is a comparison between the loss, uh, the, the optimal loss possible, and the, the loss by using the GCV pick the lambda. They are all very close to each other. So this is a validation of the theorem. Um, let's, this is for the million sum data sets. Um, so for the million sum data set, we use a, a Gaussian kernel. For the Gaussian kernel, there is another tuning parameter, tuning, which is the scale parameter for the Gaussian kernel, which is essentially how large this 
no current corner should impact in the neighboring points. So in this case, we would perform a two-dimensional grid search for both lambda and the, the, the scale parameter for the kernel function. And then these are the results. So those are the number of folds I divided the data into. And you can see almost no matter how many folds I divided those into, this lambda seems to be in here. And then for the scale parameter, this optimal scale should seems to be three. And this is the comparison between the existing method and our method from the, from the prediction error of the yield productions. So those are the existing methods, this is our methods. So obviously, by fine tuning the optimal choice for the tuning parameter, we can achieve significant gain in terms of prediction error in this dividing conquer kernel risk regression setting. So this is my talk. Time for questions. Can you use a microphone? So look, there was some work from the French statistician Guyon in the 90s uh, in order to calculate, you're aware of this work, is this mentioned? Uh, in order to calculate the trace of that uh, huge inverse that uh, yes. set you off on this approach, the idea to find the trace of A inverse is to solve the equation AX equals uh, a white noise. Yes. Uh, so okay, so I'd be interested in comments on that approach in this big problem. I'm a statistician, so I know an uh, existing word on that. Um, the difference is in statistics, you usually don't use all the data points as a basis. If you use kernel regression, you use all the data points. So one way in reducing the, per, uh, the computation cost of in that area is usually you sample subset of the data points as a basis function, so you don't do all the data points. So in that case, the, the computation time can be reduced to the Q to the cubic, which Q is essentially the number of knots you choose to use in, the, in, that, in that setting. So it's a different approach, I would say. Is the next speaker around? <laughs> I'm sorry, it seems that the next speaker is not here, so I th think we will take a 10 minute uh, break if. So we are waiting for Yang Cheng Xu too, and John Lafferty. Is, does anybody know if they're around? Otherwise, we continue in 10 minutes.
Okay, we have uh, three more talks. I hope the three speakers will show up this time. <laughs> what, what we have next is uh, Sinong Wang from Ohio State University on coded sparse matrix multiplication. Okay, thank you for introduction. And hello everyone, my name is Sinong Wang. This talk is about how to mitigate slow machines in distributed sparse matrix multiplication problem using the coding idea. The basic task, the basic task is very simple. Uh, just calculate the multi multiplication of two input matrices A and B. And to increase the computation speed in practice, we adopt a distributed computing framework such as Hadoop to compute this multiplication in multiple workers. And here is a simple example. We divide each input matrices into number of M and M parts along the raw side. And then a regional multiplication can be regarded as number of MN submatrix multiplications. And then we can allocate number of MN workers to calculate each of them. And the master node collects the results from all these workers, and then we can finish the job. Ideally, this process will increase computation speed at most MN times. But in practice, we always encounter a struggler issue. That is, some workers run much slower than the average, and the master node has to wait these strugglers to finish the job. And here is a simple experiment of previous work of distributed stochastic gradient descent. And we can see that some, some of this uh, the computation time is get delayed by at the most 10 times compared to the average, and which becomes a key bottleneck of the distributed computation system. And to resolve this issue, the most common method is using the replication technique. It replicates the task in other workers. For example, when we divide the matrix A into two parts, A1 and A2, and we have two submission multiplications, A1 transpose times B and A2 transpose times B. And we replicate each subtask into another machines. And then we can see that using this game, we can resist one strugglers using this game. And, but in practice, when we conduct some very large scale matrix multiplications, this game will impose a large redundancy. And more recently, the research community has shown that the forward error correction, named as coded computation, provides a more effective way to deal with these struggler issues. In this example, we can design the following simple coded computation scheme. That is, first two workers calculate a simple submatrix multiplications, and for the third one, we calculate the A1 plus A2 transpose times B. And we can see that using this simple scheme, the master node can recover the final results from any two workers, right? And compared to the replication scheme, this new scheme reduced redundancy by one worker. And in general, the coded distributed matrix multiplication framework works as follows. Similarly, we divide the input matrices A and B into M and N parts along the raw side. And we assign them to multiple workers, and we totally have number of capital N workers, which is larger than M N. And each worker calculates a linear combination of multiple submatrix modifications. And during this process, some workers may run slower than average, but the master node only collects a subset of the uh, only collects results of subset of workers and use certain decoding algorithm to get final results. And then we, uh, this process can be represented by the following uh, matrix notation. Each coded computation scheme can be represented by a, a coding matrix M, and each worker computes the following coded submatrix multiplications, which is a linear combination of multiple submatrix multiplication, and the coefficient Mij is, comes from the case raw of coding matrix. And then based on this notation, we can define the following metric to measure the performance of different coding schemes, and we say a coded Distribute, uh, computation scheme achieves recovery threshold KM if the master node can recover the results from any KM workers and they cannot recover it from some KM minus one workers. And which means that a good coded computation scheme will have a lower recovery threshold. 
And actually, there exists several work trying to reduce this metric by designing different coding schemes. The first work by Lee proposed a MDS-based coded computation scheme, which achieves a recovery threshold of theta n. And more recently, Yu shows that the optimal recovery threshold for this problem is actually equal to a number of cell matrix multiplication, mn. And he also designs an optimal code scheme, polynomial code, that exactly match this recovery threshold. It seems like this problem already gets an uh, optimal code design in perspective of exploring the redundancy to resist strugglers. But in practice, many problems in machine learning exhibit both extremely large scale targeting data and a sparse structure, which means that the number of non-zero elements in both input matrices and output matrices is much smaller than dimension product. So one natural question is, in this scenario, is coding really an efficient way to mitigate strugglers? And here is a simple experiment of multiplication of two randomly generated sparse matrices. We compare the optimal polynomial code with the uh, simple naive distributed uh, scheme. And then we plot the distribution of computation time of different workers. And then we can see that the polynomial code performs much worse compared to the simple naive scheme. Even there is some strugglers here. So why this phenomenon happens? The reason is that coding destroys sparsity of matrices. In the polynomial code, each worker will compute a coded submatrix multiplication, where each coded matrix is a linear combination of the original submatrices. If the original data is very sparse, this process will increase the density a lot, which will make the computation time increase a lot. So we call this phenomenon a coding struggler. So one natural question is, can we design more efficient coding schemes? To answer this question, we need to first exploit, uh, to explore the structure of existing coding schemes in perspective of coding matrices. To guarantee the optimal recovery threshold, we need to design a coding matrix M such that any M and dimensional square sub matrices are frank. And in the polynomial code, they exploit the one among the matrix to design these coding matrices. And this matrix is fully dense, which requires all the sub-workers to, to access all the sub-matrices, and which will greatly increase the density. Therefore, to res preserve the sparsity of input data matrices, we need to design a matrix M that is sparse enough. And in the meantime, this matrix M is structured that allows low recovery threshold and fast decoding. Based on this design principle, here is the construction of our new sparse code. We randomly pick number of L non-zero coefficients in each row of coding matrix M based on a degree distribution P. And we show that if we carefully design this degree distribution and combining it with a hybrid peeling decoding algorithm, we can achieve near optimal recovery threshold and extremely sparse coding matrix M and fast decoding algorithm. And we summarize the results of our new scheme and existing scheme in the table in respect of risk cover threshold, computation load, and decoding times. And we can see that our new scheme achieves near optimal recovery threshold with minimum computation load and minimum decoding time, which only depends on number of non-zero elements of output matrices. And here we also do some experimental results in computing the multiplication of two random Bernoulli sparse matrices. And one can see that our new schemes outperform all the existing schemes. And we also report the timing results for different sparse matrix multiplication problems. And one can see that our new schemes increase the computation speed at the most two times compared to existing fastest scheme. And this is our work, and thank you very much for your attention. If you are interested in our work, please come to tonight's poster session. Time for a question. In the meantime, can I ask the next speaker to set up? Can you use the microphone in the back? Uh, 
uh, because for matrix completion, we know that there is a, there are faster methods that use the recursive uh, structure of the matrix, oh. matrix multiplication. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's less than a power of three, right? Uh, so w w uh, how can you implement the, this kind of fast matrix multiplication method I in this uh, setting? Yeah, this is a good question. Yeah, for current setting, we consider only sparse matrices. We know the complexity of computing sparse matrix multiplication. It depends on number of non-zero elements, right? But for the fast matrix multiplication, th that results only holds for dense matrices, right? So this is a good idea. We currently we are co uh, considering how to use this coding scheme to to get some design for this fast algorithm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks again for the nice talk. Our next speaker is <coughs> going to be uh, on efficient stochastic decentralized learning, and the talk is going to be given by Zhe Bangsheng. My name is Zeban Shen. Uh, this is a joint work with my colleagues. And uh, in, this, this, in this talk, we're going to focus about the stochastic property and the faster convergence of our method. And uh, the other properties will be discussed, can be discussed in the post session. And uh, we, consider, what, we consider the uh, decentralized uh, convex optimization problem, where we have uh, capital N compo uh, functions distributed on, uh, sorry, on so how can I see the laser? Where is the laser? Oh, yeah. Uh, we have n, uh, capital N functions, and uh, they are distributed on uh, n uh, local machines. And each uh, they are held privately, so we can only assess the gradient oracle uh, in this uh, local machine. And uh, we assume that each uh, function is uh, the sum of Q component functions, uh, so that uh, the stochastic uh, strategy like uh, SGD or SVRG can be applied. And um, uh, in the decentralized setting, we mean that in each round, we only can do the communication between the nodes that are connected in the graph. So uh, s for the star, uh, for the star uh, topology, uh, each node only communicates with the one in the center. And for the ring topology, uh, each node only communicates with its neighbors. And for the mesh one, uh, it's a complete graph, so uh, a node can com communicate with uh, every node in this uh, graph. And uh, as we can hear, uh, as we can see here, uh, we intend to find a uh, consensus optimizer uh, optimizer for this uh, sum function, and we, uh, to incorporate the uh, the structure of the network, we can consider this uh, alternative formulation where we introduce a mixing matrix a W. Uh, in the first line, the first assumption is that we assume this uh, W matrix is sparse, in the sense that uh, if the node M and L are not in the uh, edge of the t uh, of the graph. Then this, uh, the corresponding entry in this matrix will be zero. And uh, in the third third line, the third assumption is that uh, we intend to find a consensus uh, solver for this problem, uh, because uh, if if X the matrix X uh, satisfies this uh, assumption, then uh, from the node space of this uh, from from node space property of this. Uh, matrix I, uh, identity minus W, uh, we have that uh, every row of X uh, are, ident are, is, uh, are identical to each other. And um, one way to solve this problem is to, uh, to formulate this, uh, the, 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 the unconstrained dual problem of this constrained primal problem. So uh, the dual looks like this, and uh, we can just apply the uh, accelerated uh, gradient method to solve this problem. Uh, and this is what's done by uh, Scammon in 2018 uh, at all and in 2017. And uh, however, in that paper, they do not consider the uh, uh, the finite sum structure in this uh, uh, 
a function fn. And uh, so uh, we are going to co consider another formulation, another approach, that is the uh, operator splitting approach. Uh, we first formulated this optimization problem as a, uh, a feasibility problem. We, we intend to find a feasible point C that satisfies these uh, constraints. And uh, here we use the, for, for simplicity of notation, we, use, we define this U, which is square root of identity minus W. And uh, from, the, from the assumption of the null space of W, we can see that the null space of U is the same. Is the same. Uh, so that this constraint is the same as this one, and uh, for the and for for the, the for this part, uh, since since we are finding the uh, optimal of this uh, function, then we from from the first order optimality, we can see that uh, when we take b uh, to as the uh, uh, gradient of the function f n i, uh, then we can um, this this is uh, equivalent to to this uh, the, the optimal the first order optimality of this uh, problem. And uh, additionally, this is a uh, ge more generalized uh, formulation of this problem because we can take the f, uh, the, the b and i, the operator, not only as the uh, gradient of a convex function, but as the set of gradient of uh, convex concave functions. Uh, this is a generalization, and we have other uh, interesting applications that can be captured by this formulation, but cannot be solved by this one. Uh, so um, we then talk about the uh, assumption that we made make in this paper to show uh, to, to give the convergence result, and uh, we assume that each b uh, the, the each b and i the component operator is to be a uh, mu strongly uh, monotone, which uh, corresponds to the strongly convexity in the convex case, and uh, we assume it to be error one, uh, one over error co coercive, and. Uh, to describe the connectivity of the network, we uh, we assumed uh, we we denote the uh, smallest non-single non-zero single value of identity minus w to be gamma, uh, because we know that the smallest one is zero according to the null space property. And uh, we formulate uh, such uh, uh, we, we we give the feasibility condition of such a uh, feasible feasibility problem, uh, which is given us here. Because we intend to find a b, uh, we we tend uh, we tend the uh, output of this uh, operator to be in the null space, uh, uh, in the space that's perpendicular to this uh, uh, identity, uh, this uh, uh, this this factor one one over n, and then uh, so so that we it means that we can find a uh, corresponding vector in the uh, in the span of u q uh, of u. So that uh, this add up to zero. Uh, this is from the null space property that we assumed about i minus w, and uh, this uh, this th this property is just obtained from this uh, uh, constraint. And then we can formulate this um, uh, optimal condition, optimality condi uh, feasibility condition, as uh, finding the root of the following operator t. t. Uh, you can see uh, you can just uh, uh, simple simple calculation will give you the result. And uh, to solve this kind of problem, uh, there are several wa there are several ways. The one is uh, apparently the forward step. Um, uh, if if you apply the uh, forward step to this operator t uh, t, uh, t yes, and then we can have the recovered the extra method by uh, Xi et and uh, in 2015. This is the first. Uh, this is their first paper, and the convergence uh, result is given as follows. And uh, the condition number. Uh, k kappa is the condition number of the function, and the kappa g is the condition number of the graph. Uh, so this uh, this dependence uh, this depends uh, quadratically on the condition number of the function. And uh, ho and another another problem is that uh, this uh, operator b is actually uh, evaluating this operator b actually uh, evaluates the gradient of all the component functions in the data set. So this is uh, very uh, expensive. Uh, one way to do that, uh, one way to resolve such issue is to uh, approximate this operator B by its uh, stochastic pr approximation. Uh, one way to do that is to use the SEGA approximation by, uh, proposed by DeFazio et al. in 2014. Uh, and um, if you do that, you can uh, have the, uh, and you apply this uh, forward step, you can obtain the DSA method proposed by uh, Motari and uh, Riberio. And uh, however, the, their convergence rate uh, degenerates greatly, uh, significantly. Uh, this is uh, the power to the force. And uh, because you are using the st uh, st a stochastic method, you have also dependence on the number of component functions, Q. 
And uh, so our goal is to uh, use the another, another another strategy that is a backward step, backward step to uh, alleviate uh, first uh, the uh, computation or uh, the full gradient computation, and the second one is to uh, accelerate the uh, the convergence rate. So uh, if I just uh, directly apply the uh, backward step, which is this one, uh, to the to the operator t, we uh, we obtain the p extra method, which is proposed by Xi et al. Uh, it's the second paper in 2015. Uh, however, uh, this guarantee is only obtained in our result, and they do not give this kind of guarantee. And uh, this is close to optimal uh, if we can get rid of this uh, kappa g here. Uh, this, this, this lower bound is showing the scammer paper. And, um, and the, the, the method that we uh, proposed is called the SBA uh, in, uh, in the sense that we approximate the um, operator B here with its saga approximation, just like uh, the DSC paper, but we are able to obtain a significantly better bound uh, that depends only linearly on the ni condition number of the graph, the condition number of the function, and the, the number of component. And uh, this is our method. Uh, I will not give the detailed uh, uh, implementation of this method, but we can discuss that in the poster. Okay, thank you. Questions from the audience? I have a quick question. So in the in practice, in the in the inner loop, how many iterations would you or how much accuracy would you like to have? Uh, for example, when you use saga, how many steps? Uh, what inner loop do you mean? You mean to evaluate the resolvent operator? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that depends on the problem. If you are solving like quadratic problem, that this is uh, it, uh, the, it admits a closed form solution. And if you solve problem like logistic regression, it's like you can use a Newton step because it's a one dimensional problem, so it's very efficient. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks again. Uh, another question. Go please to the microphone. In the meantime, can I ask uh, Bin Gu? Zhu Zhang Hu and Cheng Dang. Is there anybody here from faster derivative free stochastic? Oh, okay. Why we set up? There's a last. There's a question. Yeah. Very nice. Our last speaker is uh, Bingu on oh, Peng Huang, sorry, for fast derivative free stochastic optimization. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm Peng Huang. Uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a professor in EC department at the uh, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, in this work, we uh, propose a faster de uh, derivative free stochastic algorithm uh, for shared memory uh, machines. Uh, this is a joint work with my postdoc Bing Gu and my PhD student Zhou Yanhu and my collabor collaborator uh, Chen Deng. <coughs> Sorry, this uh, outline for this uh, presentation. Uh, first, I will give the uh, background for the uh, their, their order uh, algorithm, and then uh, we point out the uh, the deficiency of current algorithms. We propose a new asynchronous uh, stochastic uh, zero-state algorithm with a faster conversion rate. So I will show the impairments, uh, and after that, I will conclude the presentation. Uh, first, uh, uh, in, in machine learning uh, problems, we often can form, formulate the problem as a, uh, a finite sum of uh, a smooth, a possibly non-convex function. Uh, in, uh, in machine uh, study, we often use gradient method to uh, optimize, to solve the, the models. However, uh, in many problems, uh, it's very difficult to calculate the explicit gradient. The computational cost is very high. For example, uh, uh, in early two papers, uh, point out the graphical model inference and the structure-based uh, prediction. So it's very uh, time-consuming to compute explicit gradient. So, and also for some problem, 
uh, it's almost impossible to ca calculate the, the explicit gradient. For example, the, uh, the budget problem, uh, black box ensemble learning problems. Uh, to address such, such situation, uh, if we, it's very difficult to calculate gradient. Uh, historically, uh, we use uh, there, there's older method. We call it the derivative free method. In such method, we don't calculate gradient. We evaluate two functions. For example, here, can you see that? Oh. Here we can evaluate two, two functions using two function uh, difference to measure to approximate the gradient, uh, such that we can update the we can uh, to, to address the models. So, so when we using the there's the older uh, method uh, in the standard organization, we can update uh, using this approximation as a gradient to update the the, the algorithm. Uh, in stochastic algorithm, we can using the uh, the adapted step lines. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to run pick up colonies, uh, then using the zero order of ways to update the gradient. Uh, to deal with big data, now we often use the parallel, uh, the par parallelized or di distributed algorithm. So then, uh, in 2016, uh, in Nibs paper, uh, Lian et al. proposed the asynchronous stochastic zero order optimization. They want many want to try uh, to avoid uh, the the synchronization in parallelization calculation, so such that uh, the, uh, the, the algorithm can deal with big data. So they uh, basically they random pick up colonies to update them using the zero order method. So in this work, uh, they also prove that uh, if they can, if we can set up properly set up uh, the step lines of the uh, the. Uh, uh, the, the, the set up the proper uh, step lines. We can, uh, they, prove, they prove that uh, the, com the common rate is, uh, uh, is the two items. Uh, the sublinear item, uh, but uh, the second item will dominate the main, com main computer cost. So it's very slow. So the main reason for uh, such a uh, slow conversion rate uh, situation is uh, the large variance of the gradient because we approximate uh, the gradient using uh, the different between two functions. So that definitely we lose a lot of accuracy. So we, uh, here we summarize the uh, difference between uh, historical algorithm on uh, zero order uh, methods. Uh, the first several algorithms focus on the convex problem. Later we algorithm focus on convex and then po uh, non-convex and possibly uh, non-convex uh, problems. Um, the first uh, asynchronous uh, uh, prioritization algorithm was proposed in 2016. Uh, so they also focus on the possibly non-convex uh, problem, uh, but they didn't. Now, non algorithm focus on accelerated algorithm. They, now they are using mini batch algorithm. So you know, we propose a new algorithm to address uh, a, a, a accelerated uh, problem, and also we use the mini mini batch. We prove that uh, our common rate. Uh, is a sublinear uh, common rate, uh, much faster than, than previous work. And the B, B is uh, the size of the batch because we, we use uh, the mini batch, then we can f further accelerate uh, the computation of the algorithm. So we call our uh, algorithm as the asynchronous uh, SL plus because we accelerate existing uh, asynchronous uh, parallelization that's all the algorithm. So we, we use two, uh, two iterations, uh, two, two iterations. The, the outside iterations, so we calculate uh, one, a full approximate gradient. So you, using this one to, for different par for different, uh, for, for different process, locally, they will calculate uh, their uh, localized approximation of uh, their orders. Uh, then using this one to uh, update the, uh, the, the gradient for, for, different, uh, uh, for different colonies. So based on this algorithm, we can prove that uh, uh, our algorithm uh, has a, a sublinear conversion rate. So uh, the key point is uh, to, to improve, to accelerate the algorithm. The first the key point is uh, to, to address the deviation problem of the zero order gradient. Because we don't really do gradient, we use zero order to approximate. So we, we there is a deviation between the real gradient and the approximation uh, gradient. Uh, actually, Existing work using the, the they call it colonies smooth function. Okay, this function was proposed to uh, bridge the difference between the colonies for every colonies that there's all the gradient and uh, arena colony. Uh, in our paper, we propose a new uh, mixture mixture gradient of the colonies smooth function. 
So we sum this uh, gradient together. Actually, when we introduce such, such smooth function, we can first we can prove we can uh, achieve the proof for the sublinear compression rate. So we, we get a very good ap approximation between the uh, the full gradient and the theoretic uh, gradient and the approximation full gradient. So that's a theoretical definition for the colony smooth function. So we introduce a new mi mixture gradient to help our proof. Uh, the other issue uh, is uh, inconsistent reading because in asynchronous polarization algorithm, uh, different thread will they will access merit at a different time. So when we when we get the load of the uh, colony to the to the memory, we actually it's already the, the, the old one. So that's that's the reason for us we use the, uh, a reasonable re representation when we update uh, the colony for for every local uh, for every local process gradient. But based on this representation, uh, our proof, uh, we can get the proof. Uh, uh, we have one assumption because we assume there is a bound, there, there is a, an upper bound uh, for the delay time. So that means that we have the delay, but uh, it's, it's not a for, forever. Uh, the major theoretical contribution of, the, of our paper is that we prove that uh, our main algorithm has a uh, uh, sublinear common com rate. Uh, the, for, for the red term, is uh, uh, they are just uh, constant. The B is the size of the mini batch. Uh, and we use experiments to verify our algorithm compared to uh, the existing, uh, because now we only have two methods. One is our new method, the other one is uh, uh, the NIPS 2016 paper. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, asynchronous, so, so, so the there's all the method. So our method uh, can convert much faster, and also we compare the gradient, uh, so we get also m much lower variance on the gradient. That's the reason for us we can achieve much faster uh, conversion rate. So in this paper, we propose uh, uh, a new uh, asynchronous stochastic series order optimization algorithm. Uh, first, we point out uh, the fundamental reason leading to the slow conversion rate of existing method. Then we propose the algorithm and. Uh, we prove uh, our new algorithm has a much faster uh, conversion rate. Uh, and also we use experiments to verify our, our results. Uh, our poster is a two, uh, two, uh, 210. Uh, if, we are, if you are interested in our paper, yeah, please stop, uh, stop by my, uh, our poster. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Is there a question for the launch break? Uh, the experiment you showed, uh, w which model did you train? <laughs> oh, oh, uh, we use uh, it's a KDD CARP model. It's a multi-task learning. There's a multi-task learning. They uh, recommend systems have more than hundreds of uh, tasks. Then you average the task to do the prediction. Then that's uh, we get th actually this we follow the previous pe news papers uh, experiment setup. So because we want to get get a fair comparison. We use their experiments to uh, to show the result. We get a much faster conversion rate. Uh, okay, we are ready for the lunch break. Enjoy that, and let's thank the speakers again for the session.